Yeah, great. All right. So uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me today and allowing me to talk about uh, my own research. Uh, my name is Dr. Animesh Acharji, and uh, I am assistant professor of integrative analytics and uh, artificial intelligence, um, University of Birmingham, UK. But also, um, I'm the deputy program director of MSc Health Data Science, uh, University of Birmingham in Dubai. Um, I my affiliations are um, quite diverse, so I spend some time um, looking into the hospital, working with the clinical uh, people, but also uh, working together with the university and um, trying to develop some sort of a machine learning models uh, in the translational perspective. So um, first of all, I would like to talk about a little bit on the introduction um what exactly we're doing in translational medicine uh, domain and uh, some of the concepts about um, multi-omics integration so sometimes people call it as a fusion as well so uh, i would like to touch up on those facts and then um my plan is to talk about case studies um and there are three case studies i have chosen um, those case studies are quite diverse in terms of the data availability in terms of a little bit of the methodology aspect as well and then finally, uh, if you have any questions uh, um, and other things, we can discuss around it. Okay, so the translational research, if I'm, I'm just uh, probably everybody knows it, what does it mean? But just to keep everyone in the uh, same page, um, what I meant by translational research is once you have um, some sampling from the multiple different cohorts and you generate some sort of multi-modal or multi-omics uh, type of data sets, Okay, so what I was trying to say is, um, given a multiple different uh, data types, uh, sometimes we need to identify uh, what are the data types are important and identifying markers and, and using some sort of a methodologies. Um, after you identify the markers, then you, you find a target and then probably it is a good, um, good target for your further pipeline or some validation. Um, okay. So uh, what we do actually um, is around the data every day. I mean, in me and my group is quite interested in three types of data and the data is coming in a kind of a dif different sources of the data. So one of the data is the lab data or stakeholders data, meaning that people do their experiments and they come to us and asking, okay, I have this type of data. Can you help us to analyze those data and give some sort of a feedback? What do you see in this data set? There is another type of data, which is the public data sets. I mean, uh, if you talk about uh, multiple different um, transcriptomics like RNA sequencing data, or maybe metabolomics and microbiome data sets, um, those are all public and, and those data sets can, can be used for, for the validation purpose in a methodological way as well. The third type of data which is coming in front of our group is uh, coming from the hospitals, uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham mainly, and those data sets are quite unstructured in nature, uh, meaning that they are has a image, uh, ECGs, uh, X-rays, electronic health record data. So that means um, you need to think about how to process those data sets and trying to make usable for a clinical decision anyway. However, if someone is giving you the data sets, one of the important thing is you can use, if the design of the studies or, or trial is similar, you can use it for the, for the validation. So coming back to this multiple different data centric view. So we are asking multiple different questions in our lab. One of the question is how you integrate uh, multiple two or three or, or maybe n number of data types um, given multiple different modalities. Then question is how do you include some top of it? For example, if someone is generating some RNA sequencing and maybe metabolomics or LCMS data, can you fuse some sort of a qualitative information? So, so I'll, I'll go a little bit in deep uh, what the, what I mean by the qualitative information. Um, for example, if I know some some prior knowledge about the information, can I fuse in my model and, and this model can be working a little bit better? And then a couple of other things like uh, how you define the stable markers for, for the diagnostics and how those multimodal data interact with each other and giving rise to the phenotypic trait. 
So if if you can see this these things these questions could be can be kind of a, a scattered around multiple different dimensions. So uh, what what we've done is actually dissected all the questions in three different portfolio. So number one portfolio is the multi omics or multimodal integration, um, where uh, sometimes we are interested in mechanistics and sometimes we are interested in methodological aspect as well. The second one, as I said, uh, discovery of uh, features which can be uh, equally important for the uh, trial, but also if there any way we can identify some causality of those markers as well. The third one is the computational, which is development of workflows, development of uh, uh, mathematical modeling, and those mod mathematical modeling starting from the differential equation-based modeling, statistical modeling, or, or the machine learning modeling, mostly the quantitative uh, modeling. So let's talk about the first portfolio, and I'll be focusing on out of these three different things only on the multi-omics integration. So what I mean by multi-omics integration? So this is uh, this paper came out. Uh, two of them actually. One of them is a group from the Canada in 2021. Another uh, paper came out in um, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole idea of the multimodal integration is um, is you will have uh, multiple different data types. And in the literature, people talk about three different ways you can do the multi-omics integration. Number one, we call it early integration. So early integration means you combine multiple data, for example, in an Excel file, and top of it, you do some machine learning model, and then you try to identify which are the features coming out from this model. So that's the first way of doing it. Second way of doing it called the data transformation or projection-based method or transformation-based method. This is um, like, a, um, like a mainly, um, um, score um, uh, projection based methodology like uh, PLS, partial least square regressions, uh, principal component analysis, or factor analysis like MOFA can be used for this type of uh, uh, integration. The third type of integration is called as a late integration, where you do the data analysis sequentially, meaning that you, if you have a three or four different types of data, you treat each of the data sequentially, meaning that let's say you have an X amount of the data. X is a data matrix, let's say it is RNA sequencing, you use some sort of a methodology, identify some marker, keep it a parking slot. You take another data, repeat exactly the same analysis, keep it in a parking slot, and then trying to use later on some sort of a graph theory methodology and then integrate them. So we call it as a late integration. Now the late integration further, I kind of saying two different types of late integration. One is the quantitative integration and the qualitative integration. So quantitative integration means the completely data-driven strategy. So you have given the data and you are identifying the lead and then those lead is going in a translational uh, phase, okay? Now qualitative integration, meaning that uh, you, you not only have the quantitative data, but also you are fusion of prior knowledge. And I will talk about a little bit on, on those sites as well, yeah? So let's talk about first the quantitative integration. What does it mean? So this is uh, this is the quantitative integration strategy. I've been working this kind of quantitative integration for, for quite some time now. And, and uh, these are um, all my papers referenced apart from the uh, papers I have mentioned earlier. So you, as I said, you have a patient cohort, you have a multiple different types of technology starting from like, maybe metagenomics or 16X microbiome, you have a methylation or epigenetics, uh, you have a RNA sequencing or, or flow cytometry from the inflammation, and, and then you might have the mass spectrometry data as well. And after pre-processing, you get a matrix or some sort of a structured data where your rows and columns are defined. And what you all do, you're trying to identify from each of the matrices, what are the important parameters you need to look at. And here, there is a quite a lot of computational method or challenges uh, need to be solved. I mean, like a feature selection, feature importance, variable selection, those things could be quite important here. And then further, what you do, you kind of a, a fusion, some sort of a association network. Um, um, again, I'm very careful saying the causality. We're not talking about the causality here. Uh, causality is very hard until and unless you do the follow up some experiments, um, you really cannot derive the causality. Um, however, there are some methodology like graphical Gaussian model, graphical modeling techniques. You can, you can use some sort of a method to direct your network as a causal network. But again, it is not just causal network uh, in my opinion. And later on, uh, you're trying to understand the mechanistics, meaning that you want, I mean, if you're someone is working in the cancer, you wanted to understand how the cancer is progression and other things. Yes, please. Yeah, 
sure and how we can introduce this to the model because uh, like the turnover of RNA is just going to be protein. So then, then uh, we're in proteomics and transcriptomics. This could potentially uh, problematic. It could be potentially problematic. Yeah, so I'm repeating the question. I mean, someone asked me here uh, in the in the in the whole room is uh, what about the half life? How can you do it? I mean, if someone is measuring the half life, so I would say I will come back to this topic in the qualitative integration. How can you include that? Yeah. So so I mean, remind me if I'm not answering your question, but I'll come back to that one. Yeah. All right. So so this is a kind of a quantitative approach. Now let's talk about the qualitative approach. Okay. Now, in the qualitative approach, what is happening? Let's say you have a cohort one, and then you have a um, some sort of a clinical phenotype or other phenotypes. Uh, cohort two, um, you you might have some clinical phenotype. You might have some other measurement as well. So traditionally, what you do if you wanted to identify combine multiple different cohorts, what you do you do meta analysis, right? And because you you have might have some some features of interest but the measurements has done in multiple different cohorts. So cohorts are coming from, let's say, Italy, one cohort from Belgium, one is from UK, and you wanted to estimate what the effect size um, across multiple cohorts. Now, going taking this similar idea in a, in a multimodal framework, so how, how does it work? So, so if, I, if I translate this framework in a multimodal settings, what is happening here? I kind of a cohort one, cohort two, let's say you have, a, you have a, um, four different cohorts, and for one cohort number one, you have a genes and metabolite. However, for cohort number three, you have a genes, metabolites, and microbiome profile. The question is, you really cannot integrate because they are not from the same samples and preferably, probably they are not sampling in the same time as well. So this is a big challenge, yeah? Now, but then it is quite useful if we can get some sort of a sense, some sort of a, um, um, a value, I mean, what we are looking at. So what, what the idea? Idea is you, you integrate in a higher dimensional space, you use the ontology, you use NLP, natural language processing, you use um, some sort of a um, weighted matrices and you talk about, um, you, you go away from the cohort and then you talk about in a biological sense as well, yeah? I'm still working on, on, on this domain. Um, I have published a couple of papers, but I thought I could improve it um, um, significantly um, using some sort of a, um, uh, uh, new technologies there. So, uh, prospective studies. But then, I mean, if you have for prospective studies, then why are you not planning them for you? The, this is a good question. I mean, I mean, this is so. I, I mean, I'm I'm involved in that. We are we, sometimes we are, we are not including many of the things coming as, as a kind of a in a, in a in a open space sometimes we have the the data in a publicly as well. The question is if you can use it. So. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a valid question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's let's go through a little bit on the case studies and and uh, showing some of the examples um, uh, how we can we can kind of a um, in a interdisciplinary settings how can we kind of a discover some knowledge. So this is one example from the um, PSC IBD. So uh, frankly speaking, I I'm I'm not a disease specialist. I I I don't know much about the IBD, but I do work with the clinical people. So they always give me the feedback about how the disease is progressing. So the PSC looks like it is a rare disease, and but it is not an IBD. Okay, so that's what they 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 say it to me. Okay, so if you look at the literature, what is uh, people are trying to discover in these uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis PSC is uh, many of the studies uh, they they kind of a um, the problem is sometimes when the patients are coming into the clinic uh, there is a ambiguity is it IBD patient or or PSC patient and they wanted to understand the mechanism of of the disease and they want to understand what is um how differently IBD uh, from the PSC patients okay so the claim we are trying to make is the PSC is not ulcerative colitis so PSC derived ulcerative colitis is not IBD derived ulcerative colitis that that's the claim so what we have done to achieve it, so uh, as you can see here, healthy control patients, only 10 samples, and the PSC ulcerative colitis, only 10 samples, and ulcerative colitis, which is IBD, only 10 samples. Now, I mean, if someone is statistics background, and if I show this data, they will first of all rule out the 10 samples, you cannot really do any sensible analysis, uh, which is true, but we have used it as a kind of a pilot. We, we are interested if we can derive some sort of a mechanistics out of those data sets. 
So those samples are derived from the mucosal part. And then as I showed earlier, they, there were some sort of a data matrix and, and we have used some sort of decision tree based algorithms and uh, um, selection of the markers. Uh, we were interested which markers are coming out in each of the domain and how the combination of those marker look like, how the combination of multiple different modalities look like in this case, just an association, not the causality. So first thing we have looked at the variation in the cohort. So um, if you if you see here and variation in the cohort using the RNA sequencing data. So I have used 1,200 differential genes here, try to plot these, um, this PCA. So the first one is called the score plot in the PCA. And I'm trying to show here how different the, the PSC versus ulcerative colitis. So 10 patients, is it heterogeneous? If, if how the structure look like in this. Below, I am trying to show a heat map just to tell you that because you cannot read the name of the genes and that's not the objective. The objective is if uh, on average, how many genes are upregulated and how many genes are downregulated? Is it majority of the genes in the PSC? Is they are upregulated or not? So, so what we found is the majority of the genes, as I said, quite a lot of genes are upregulated. And in the volcano plot, you can see the corner genes, which is a very low p-value and very high fold change. Uh, that was quite interesting for us. And we thought maybe these genes, we need to look at a little bit carefully and trying to understand some sort of a biological mechanism, um, what is happening in, in those, those genes. By the way, those genes we got, these are kind of a multifactorial. They are not only for the PSC, but also some of the genes we got in the colon cancer perspective too. So like, a, like some of the genes, which is a chemokine gene, CXCL3, CXCL family, these are kind of a, we also found in the colon cancer patients too. So understanding the pathway level. So this is a kind of a very typical enrichment analysis and pathway enrichment analysis. And you can see the multiple different uh, um, uh, circles, the, the size of the circle representing if there are many genes are involved in the biological process, meaning the circle big gets bigger. If the low number of genes present in particular pathway, that becomes smaller. And these are just a connectivity using um, uh, using cytoscape uh, platform uh, gives us a quite nice uh, visualization around it. So we kind of try see multiple different pathways part of in this process. The question is, this is just RNA sequencing. What about the microbiome data? What about the inflammation data? How they look like in this process? So actually I have kind of a, in my group, uh, we have looked at a very detail in the inflammatory markers. We did not have much inflammatory markers. Um, we have um, seven uh, inflammatory markers out of seven. Two of them looks like doing something in this cohort. One is TH17 and IL-17. So it was quite interesting how IL-17 and TH17 immune parameters are giving effect to these disease states. In terms of the microbiome profile, we did not get much of the variations in terms of the genus level, in terms of the family level. However, there were some sort of in phylum level, you can see a little bit of differences. Now we had a candidate. We had candidates two from uh, IL-17, TH-17. These uh, we, we, we thought may be interesting and then we can use for the graph analysis later on. Um, and uh, uh, out of 1,200 genes, I have used some sort of a iterative objective function and trying to identify um, which are the genes is important. So I have identified 20 genes, 20, 25 genes around uh, finally for, for, my, for my final graph analysis. So the final graph analysis look like quite busy. As you can see here, um, it's very difficult to uh, understand which is what. So the, the, the node, which is starting with the G, this is for the gene. And then you can see the name of the genes in the table. Um, the O for the OTUs, which is coming from the microbiome domain, and there is a IL-17 and TH-17, which is giving impact. So this is, I have done using the stochastic algorithms, and I am asking my algorithm, okay, give me best solution in the time and space, and give me if there are any structure. So I instructed my graph, instructed the algorithms to give me the best solution with the selected parameters. If I do so, they, they give me some sort of interesting clusters automatically. And then those clusters were quite provocating. And when I have shown my collaborators uh, clinical parameters, uh, clinical uh, medical doctors, and they said, okay, that looks um, quite interesting. And would be nice to know what are those genes and how they mechanistically impact. Uh, by the way, there are two colors, as you can see, one is the positive correlation, one is the negative correlation. And this is, as I said, we have not gone that far in the causality, but this is just an association network in a way. Uh, can, can I take a question after I finish? Because because otherwise time is, yeah, yeah. Please come back to questions, yeah. Okay, so mechanistic understanding is 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 the is is, is the bioelectric metabolism. So once we looked at those genes, it looks like that there is a 
upregulations in the bile acid. And because of the upregulations, many of the downstream transcription factors and many of the downstream analyses has gone, many of them are upregulated in the process. Especially the UGT family genes, UGT1, UGT6, many of the UGT family genes are kind of involved in this process. And, and we try to look at in the in the literature and we found there are quite a lot of um, um, review paper came out uh, actually in that time and they talked about how microbiome bile acid and mucosal immune system kind of interdependent with each other. So it's kind of a quite a learning for us, I mean, in a way. And then we ask a question, okay, we have given the drug with those patients, some sort of a VEDO uh, at anti-TNF uh, um, uh, drug, and then we wanted to measure the responses of those target. And, and we wrote a grant and we got some money to, uh, for doing it. However, this paper, as I said, I mean, it's a pilot study. So we published in Journal of Chronic Colitis. If you're interested, um, you can have a look into this, how the methodologically we have done these ones. But similar methodology we have applied in multiple other studies. I mean, they're starting from the gut microbiome uh, uh, journals where we are trying to integrate uh, the amino acid profiling, the fecal microbiota um, and the proteomics data, uh, trying to understand what is happening and then trying to generate some hypothesis and, and uh, um, um, generating some new trial. So that's one of the example I try to give and, and I will move into this uh, second um, example, which is the qualitative integration. So in the qualitative integration, I am I am I am interested in how um, how we can how we can fuse um, uh, multiple different uh, data sets and one of the uh, interesting um, avenue for pancreatic cancer. Okay, and this data is coming from um, University of Bern and in Bern University Hospital from Switzerland. Um, um, and there is a there is a group which who is working on on this uh, pancreatic cancer, and we looked at multiple different aspects of pancreatic cancer. One of them is the long term survival versus short term survival. As you know, I mean pancreatic cancer is a quite a very drastic cancer. I mean your survival rate is one to two years. I mean, I, and, and then it reflected in the data too. Yeah. And the second example, we have looked at the tumor budding. I mean, we have counted the tumor budding, and then we link with uh, if the tumor budding is associated with the survival, is it associated with long-term or short-term survival of the patients? And the third one, we have looked at the recurrences of the of the pancreatic cancer. So not only just um, pancreas, but the liver recurrences and, and, and the other recurrences around those. So I'll just highlight a couple of examples here. Yeah. Now, I'm, 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 remember, I'm talking about the qualitative integration, and then... Um, uh, this is just one example in the literature, how people are treating the qualitative information in the model, okay? So this paper came out from the Thip Shirani group from the Stanford Department of Statistics, and they have uh, they have done some work on, on, the, um, on the mechanistic uh, um, um, uh, problem, and they used um, um, immunological knowledge as a prior. So what they have done essentially in, in their data, they ask every individual uh, expert, immunological expert, what do you think about this immune parameter? Is it important or not important? And they used as a vector in their model. So they have used traditional elastic net modeling, but then in elastic net modeling, they have fused a prior vector, which is called as a prior, as a, and, 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 and shown how prior vector can be uh, useful for prediction of the new data as well. So that's the prior knowledge, but also sometimes people call it as a target features. For example, if you're working for a particular system for a longer time, you might have some sort of a features you wanted to trace, and sometimes you use it a positive control. That also can be fused in your model, yeah? And there are other, nowadays, I think this one I have taken from the next example on the, on the, on the prostate cancer discovery, where they have used the deep neural network, and they have used the multiple different nodes, and together with some prior vectors here. But there are quite other other examples as well. Just I, I just put it just to give you a kind of a background to what I'm looking at. Coming back to the pancreatic cancer, I mean, as I started talking about the the survival of the pancreatic cancer. So first one is the tumor budding. I mean, um, I mean, as you can see in the left hand side, there is a differences between inflammatory markers in terms of the um, the low versus um, uh, high grade tumor budding. And we have shown if you do a Kaplan-Meier plot. Um, our survival analysis, it is very clear that they impact uh, this type of analysis quite drastically. Yeah. Now, from this cohort, we, we had some sort of a gene expression data, but gene expression data was quite targeted. There are around nanostring and there are around six to seven uh, genes. And then um, the interest was uh, without doing any immunological experiment, uh, they were interested to know if their immune parameters are associated. Okay. So, 
The question is, we have a gene expression data and we want to understand the inflammatory markers or inflammation landscape. And the process is called the immune deconvolution. So we wanted to use the, some sort of a immune deconvolution methodology to understand and, and mixture between quantitative and the qualitative data. The question is, what is immune deconvolution? So I'm the so first paper came out around 2015 in the Nature Method um, and the Newman et al. from Stanford um, as well. What they have done is they have shown if you give a gene expression profile in the genome wide, and and there is a way you can estimate how much immune profile can be can be targeted for this particular cohort. Okay, so essentially what you do, you kind of write a linear regression problem, um, and then you try to show a kind of a linear combination of your genes and trying to estimate um, the weights uh, which is getting for each of the immune parameters. Now, this is true that not all the all the times you will have all the very deep sequencing or deep uh, phenotyping for the immune markers, but at least some of the databases, they have quite like B-cell, T-cell, fibroblast, they are quite re uh, redundant or abundant in many of the databases. So coming back to the immune deconvolution, if you look at the literature, you can see that the field last five, six years has developed quite a lot and people have a growing interest, uh, especially um, in the hybrid domain, people who are doing immunological um, analysis, but also people are doing um, a mathematical analysis, like many of the mathematical driven, like non-complex optimization, many of the based on the uh, regression problem and, and we can formulate in, in the way we want and then trying to find the solution around it. For this particular study for the pancreatic cancer, we found, um, I mean, I mean, some of the B cells, some of the cancer assisted fibroblast and many other things quite significant. So I think it is very important to know here, we have done gene expression, we have not done the immune parameters, but we wanted to estimate, is there any probability that these are the immune parameters will be involved in this process? So that's, that's about the immune uh, deconvolution. And then further, we have looked at the recurrent and non-recurrent sites, and we wanted to understand if some of the sites have an impact on the survival uh, as well. So which is clear, I mean, some of the, if, as you can see, the Kaplan-Meier plot, there is a quite a differences between the organs of the recurrent recurrences. And that also, um, you, you can see multiple parameters, sometimes they are down-regulated, sometimes they are up-regulated as well. So from this analysis, uh, recurrence analysis, we found some of the novel target. I mean, those targets novel, I mean, at least in this context, but this target has been, has been pronounced in the literature for many, many years for multiple different disease front and multiple different pathogenesis. But we have shown in this particular study that immune parameter, gene expression, and, and other things is, is can be uh, quite interesting, um, given that pancreatic cancer data is very hard to get uh, uh, in this domain. Now, and then we are asking, okay, if we consider these are the target, is there any way we can we can identify the new target? So, so first of all, you identify the target, you claim this is a target, and from the target, you try to derive new probable um, equally, maybe some potential candidates uh, uh, for, for uh, um, new target too. So uh, from this, uh, what I have looked at is, I have looked at multiple different data types, uh, looking at the TCGA, looking at multiple other validation and many other different data types and, and looking into uh, how we can combine two matrices um, um, uh, together and trying to integrate them and trying to identify if there are any association. Yeah. So here we are talking about the sparse partial least square regression type of methodology. We are using the regularized canonical correlation type of analysis, uh, where you, I mean, I mean, the point is regularized. We are using the the always we have a p greater than n problem. Always, I mean, number of features always are higher compared to the number of samples. So you do the regularization. You penalize each of the matrices, and 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 then you try to identify if there are any um, if there are any lead coming up from there. Now, it is very important to understand here, in this case, Y is matrix two, Y is not a vector. So you are penalizing the two matrices simultaneously and regularizing two matrices at the same time and trying to identify some target. So this is the paper. I mean, we have submitted the paper and, and uh, we hope uh, there will be some, some discussions around those. Um, yeah. So these are the paper um, is very much linked with what I've said so far. So the paper I, I talked about recurrences we have published in the GUT um, very recently earlier this year. Uh, there are other papers I talked about, um, but also we have uh, we, we have I have also interest in the short chain fatty acid synthesis bacterial species, which is uh, uh, coming from the microbiome and how they interact with the amino acid profiling. So that's the another example. So I think I have uh, five minutes left. 
yeah, I think I have five minutes left and I'll quickly go through last one, last case study, which is the big data integration using the explainable AI. Okay, now there is an AI versus explainable AI. There are two different kind of things. So people, when I talk about my model to my clinical people, my collaborators, they're kind of sometimes saying, okay, tell me in SVM how the model weight it is going on. Tell me how the decision tree analyzes, which one is the weight. So this is quite difficult. So, I mean, it, this is true for the deep learning based model as well, um, that your interpretability is not very focused. You are focusing on the prediction, not necessarily the interpretation. The whole point of using the explainable AI is, can you explain, can you explain what is happening inside the model? Is there any kind of a sensible way to understanding? Yeah. And there are two papers, very technical papers, but I think these are the kind of a starting point for explainable AI in the clinical domain. But this field is kind of a, a many different types already in the literature, like people use the Lime, um, like locally interpretable model, people using the sharp, sharply additive explanations, and, and all these kind of things. By the way, sharp is coming from the game theory perspective. You want it to identify in a game, many players are contributing, but who is contributing? Can you estimate some sort of a, um, some guessing or some sort of a uh, idea about uh, uh, the contribution from the players, yeah? Okay, so this is a little bit of this, uh, kind of introduction of the explainable AI, but question is which data I'm looking at. So I'm looking at the UK Biobank. So having in UK, one of the advantage in our group is accessibility to the UK Biobank. And this is really a kind of a source of the big data. And this data is, is, is a kind of a huge, very deep sources of phenotype and genotype analysis. Uh, nowadays also they have a NMR data metabolite, but they are planning to put some proteomics data. So I think it is ongoing. And then next three months, there will be a proteomic data as well. Yeah. So together with my, my master's students, so we, we have worked on the UK Biobank data specifically looking at um, uh, IBD, in the blood marker versus, um, and then you know that when you did derive a model, um, I wanted to use the unbiased estimates of the model, and I wanted to use some new data sets for estimates of my 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 classifier, whatever classifier I'm using. So I have used the HMP2 DB I'm uh, uh, IBD uh, DB database, which is um, um, uh, which is another database. So idea is train the model on the UK Biobank, identify which are the features are playing the role, and then predict on the externally new data set. But then it is very important to careful, I mean, I mean, for the interpretations, one is the blood, another is the fecal, okay? So there will be differences. So be, I, mean, I mean, we need to be aware of what, what I'm doing as well in the, in, in the same time. Okay, so that's the one objective. The second objective, I also wanted to understand how the meta, so we have looked at the metabolite and diet. We are also interested how diet is interacting with the metabolite as well, yeah? And then later on to fuse multiple other information and make it and reach uh, in terms of the modeling technique. So these are the couple of the results. So when I use the explainable AI or sharp values on the, in the left-hand side in the figure A, what you are looking at, the ranking of your metabolite level coming from the UK Biobank, you can see glycine A, uh, and there are two different colors. You can see um, the red color versus the, the, the blue color um, and the importance, each of the dots represent the patients or, or, the, or the samples here, yeah? So you can see how many samples actually abundant or the high value, how many samples are low value, yeah? And in the B, you can see the normal uh, random forest analysis, which is you are looking at global importance. I mean, you, it doesn't tell you, if, if looking at the glycine A, already glycine A in the top. However, you, you don't have any clue how the distribution of the values of the glycine E mediating across your metabolite profile or, or, your, or your nutritional profile, yeah? So that looks interesting. Then, uh, then we have kind of a, because the number of metabolite was not very, very, I think there are 12 or 13 metabolites. So we have picked up uh, a top five just, to, or, or, or all of them some, sometimes, just to see if we can prioritize those metabolite for further analysis. Uh, this is the interactions. I mean, we are interested I mean, across how the diet and so one one axis, y axis is is the is the is the metabolite and the and the x axis is the diet. We wanted to see how the correlated they are or not. If there are any differences between between these two different cohorts. Surprisingly, we get a quite a drastic results. Actually, one of the data works very well, and one of the data did not work very well. You can see the AUC value of the. A UK biobank, which is coming from the blood, which is quite 
uh, not that as good as comparing to um, IMB database. And and one of the reason is that we are not looking at Apple to Apple. We are looking at Apple to peer. One is the blood samples. One is the fecal samples. And that could explain one part here as well. So it may be some of the car, uh, some of the part is coming from the variation as well. Yeah. So we are investigating a little bit more on on those sites. So coming back to the summary slide, so what I try to show you, maybe the integrative analysis, I mean, if you have the possibility, it can give you some sort of a mechanistic understanding of your disease or maybe your drug response and you're trying to identify which pathways are actually playing role. And it helps you um, kind of a, um, giving a lead in the next level in the translational medicine um, uh, medicine sector. Sample size is a big problem. I mean, in the omics, we don't do, I mean, I mean, 1,000, like epidemiological studies, we don't do 1,000 samples for, for the omics. I mean, this is a cost, uh, not very cost effective. So that is, uh, um, we, we need to live with overfitting problems with the multiple cross validation, external data, and all other things. Experiment is necessary, absolutely. I mean, if you wanted to derive some sort of a causality, um, then like, people are doing the Mendelian randomization or GWAS analysis uh, or with the DNA, and assumption is DNA to DNA to to phenotype, I mean, genotype to phenotype. But then here, if you wanted to work with other omics data here, you need to think about how you are doing your experiments. And definitely this is an interdisciplinary area. I mean, we should learn from each other. We should learn from the computer science and clinical science, and that gives a quite a nice environment for learning each other. And this is the one of the paper I, I, I wrote to the, the translational medicine communication. And to, a, apart from that, how do you lead your group? I mean, together with your technical knowledge, you also need to have some sort of a translational leadership because you are not going to know, for example, if I'm talking to clinical people, they probably not necessarily know how I can regularize my function, alpha or lambda, they will not be careful about it. So the communication is very important. How do you manage your projects and follow-ups, follow-on is, is very important. So that means your leadership will come from the, if you can see there are multiple circles, it will come from the inside of the circle and then it, the, your soft skill, towards your soft skill, you lead your technical skills later on. So, for the collaborations, as I said, collaboration is important. I do collaborate across multiple different people in the in the um, uh, in the university, but also I have a very global portfolio. I do work with the people in the, across the globe, including multiple different diseases. Uh, and as I said, I'm not a disease expert, but I do translate the methodology in across multiple different disciplines. Actually, I have done my PhD in plant breeding, so you can see I'm coming from the plant breeding, but I'm talking like, like as if I know many things in the clinical domain, but it's not the case. I just translate the models and then understand the requirement and then trying to translate. These are a couple of EU grants we got. This is the 10 million grant we got with a, with a precision medicine. We're working on the hypertension. This is my group and we got a 10 million. Uh, last week, actually, I was in Spain working and, and the avenue we are looking at also in the multiple different metabolite profiling and hypertension com in patients coming from multiple different trials around 4,000 patients we are going to sample on the hypertension. And this will be the first study across multiple, uh, involving multiple different uh, cohorts here. This is another grant with the European U USA grant, USA, uh, something called Welcome Leap and Dynamic Resilience. We are interested working if you have a more than 60 years old and if you have a, a operation, what, your, what are the factors defining your resilience? Uh, why you are not working before this type of resilience. So we are going to do a lot of deep phenotyping, including microbiome analysis, um, metabolic analysis, single cell RNA sequencing, very, very heavy, deep phenotyping, and, and integrating those, trying to understand and follow up those studies. And this is my group, and uh, many people are involved in this group. So I'm, I'm always actively looking for my collaborators across multiple different countries. Um, and... Uh, and I will be hiring a postdoc soon. And if you're interested, please let me know. I will be very excited and uh, talk through. Um, and, and as you can see, kind of a divergent uh, portfolio based on your background you're coming from. If you are a computational scientist, then maybe you are fitting in in the right side of my portfolio, but we, with the heavy interactions with the first two domains. Yeah, and these are the other people, and I'm grateful for inviting me here. But also I'd like to acknowledge my funder, which is called Health Data Research UK, funding us. Um, NIHR is funding our National Institute of Health Research, um, University Hospitals in Birmingham, and many other funders. And, uh, and thank you very much for your uh, listening to me, and I'm happy to take any questions.